Hallo, ich bin Thomas und ich komme aus den Niederlanden. Ich arbeite aber hier in Würzburg am Lehrstuhl für Informatik 1. Da arbeiten wir an Algorithmen und Komplexität. Ich halte dieses Semester die Vorlesung Algorithmen für geografische Informationssysteme, wo wir uns Probleme und Anwendungen aus der Geografie anschauen. Und in der kommenden Video schauen wir uns ein Teilproblem an von Map Matching. Map Matching findet statt in Navis oder heutzutage wahrscheinlich eher auf dein Handy, wenn du navigierst. Dein Handy hat einen GPS-Sensor, Global Positioning System. Damit kann man so ungefähr bestimmen, wo man ist auf der Erde, aber eigentlich nicht so genau. Also die Daten müssen noch irgendwie intelligent verarbeitet werden. Und dazu schauen wir uns die Sachen, wie so oft bei unserem Lehrstuhl, erstmal mathematisch an, sodass wir ordentlich und beweisbar gute Lösungen finden. Es stellt sich heraus, um die ungenauen GPS-Daten gut sorten zu können auf einer Straßenkarte, ist es sinnvoll, eine mathematisch saubere Antwort zu haben auf die Frage, wie ähnlich sind zwei gegebene Kurven. Und darum geht es in der kommenden Video. Vorab noch ein Ding, wie gesagt, ich bin Holländer, wir haben hier an der Uni sehr internationales Personal und deswegen sind in der Master die Vorlesungen auch nicht immer auf Deutsch. Ich mache meine Vorlesungsvideos dieses Semester auf Englisch und deswegen ist das kommende Video auch auf Englisch. Also, viel Spaß ähm, und Grüße hier aus der Residenzgarten in Würzburg. Hoffentlich sehen wir uns mal. Let's talk about polylines. In the previous video, we ended up with a problem statement for map matching that involved comparing polylines. More specifically, we wanted to find a path through the road network that had minimal distance to a particular sequence of GPS points. And for the moment, let's forget about the road network. Let's say our road network is actually represented by a graph with straight lines, and now we consider one particular path. So that's also a polyline. Let's talk about polylines. Here are two polylines, P1 and P2, and now I want you to think about the question, how far away are these two polylines? What is the distance between them? Now, of course, I don't want you to give me a number, there is no scale, so how would that even work? But just conceptually, what does it mean, distance between polylines? Now, if I move them around a bit, then I would say like this makes the distance larger, and this makes it smaller again, but... What does this do? How about this change? Is that more distant now? I'll say this a couple more times during the semester, but how you define things depends on what you want to use the definition for. We start with a distance function between two points, and we'll just use Euclidean distance there. So square root of x difference squared plus y difference squared. And then we lift this distance function from pairs of points to pairs of polylines as follows. In the eigentliche Vorlesung besprechen wir jetzt die sogenannte Hausdorf Distanz, was die Definition ist und wie man sie effizient berechnet. Das erfordert aber algorithmische Vorkenntnisse und führt hier ein bisschen zu weit. Wir machen weiter mit der Frechet Distanz. Let's talk about polylines. We already know one way to compare them, and that's the Hausdorff distance. But what we really wanted to do was solve map matching. And in that context, something a little bit weird is going on with the Hausdorff distance. Now, these two polylines are quite dissimilar, so in a way it's not entirely fair to compare them. But if you don't have a lot of GPS points and there's a bunch of noise, something like this could happen. So along the polyline P1, we can look at these points P1, Q1, and R1. And then for each of them, let's see where the minimum is realized on the distance to the polyline P2. And now my claim is, in terms of map matching, this is kind of weird, because if we go along P2, we encounter these points in the order Q2, P2, R2. But it used to be PQR, so what are we saying here? Are we really saying that our explanation for the blue polyline is that somebody went on the red road and went to P2 and then came back to Q2 and then swapped directions in this way? I don't think so. And worrying about this kind of consistency brings us to the definition of the Frechet distance. Informally it goes like this. I have this suspicious looking man in a trench coat on the blue polyline and I have his dog on the red polyline. And then there is a dog leash between them, indicated in black for their current positions in this diagram. Both of them only go forward on their polyline and that means that from now on the polylines are directed. 
Like I said, they're not allowed to go backwards, but they are allowed to stand still and move at any speed. And our question becomes, how long does the dog leash need to be in order for both of them to reach the end of their polyline? We get to pick the progression of each of them along their polyline, and then the Frechet distance is the minimum of all possible ways to walk of how long the line needs to get. And I would say that intuitively this is a decent distance measure between the polylines. And for map matching it even gives us a reasonable mapping from the one curve to the other. Let's talk about polylines. So far I've treated them as a set of points and the linear interpolations between subsequent points. Now we'll look at an entire polyline as one parameterized curve. So let's call our first polyline P1, small p at this point, because this is now a function that gives us a single point, and it has, as its argument, a number t. And this t is a real number between 0 and m minus 1, where m is the number of points. We define this function as follows. For integer t, p1 of t is the t plus first vertex of p1. So p1 of 0 is the first vertex, and this really shouldn't be confusing to us as computer scientists, because we start a lot of things at 0 anyway. And for non-integer t, it is the linear interpolation just like before. There's nothing new here, but it'll be useful to talk about it as a function like this. So, for example, p1 of 2.5 is p1 of 2, plus 1 half of the difference between p1 of 3 and p1 of 2. Here comes the mathematical definition, which sieht beängstigender aus als sie wirklich ist, aber wir überspringen sie trotzdem. Es gibt für euch ja auch keine Klausur. Und wir können die Sache auch grafisch verstehen. Falls es euch wirklich interessiert, habe ich es am Ende vom Video noch angefügt. We'll take two approaches here, and both of them are kind of good tricks to know. The first one is if something is too complicated to understand, let's just make it simpler. So let's actually not talk about polylines, let's talk about line segments, and this will simplify our lives a lot. And now there is somebody coming in a car, so let's wait for a second. And the other thing is, sometimes it's hard to optimize something, but it's easier to decide if the optimum is at least a certain value or at most a certain value. So that's what we'll do here. We'll pick some epsilon and then we'll make an algorithm to decide is the Frechet distance between these two polylines at most epsilon. So this is now the simplified problem that we will actually look at. Given two line segments, single line segments, is their Frechet distance at most epsilon? And in order to do that, we'll look at a thing called the free space diagram, or parameter space. And so parameter space is the following. I have these two functions, alpha and beta, and they give me the progress along the curve. And now that's just progress along the line segment. Now in this parameter space, I take as my two axes how far along am I along each of the polylines. So my parameter space is a unit square. And for any point in this unit square, I'm really talking about two points on these line segments. And these two actual points have an actual distance. So now, in parameter space, I can talk about distances. So any point in this unit square is two points on these line segments, which gives me a Euclidean distance. And I already mentioned the other simplification that we'll take, which is we just decide is it at most epsilon or not. So now for any point in parameter space, I can say this is okay, these points are close enough, these two points do not contradict that the Frechet distance is at most epsilon. And for other points, if this epsilon is violated, then I cannot have the man at this point and the dog at this point, because then I would have Frechet distance more than epsilon. So now basically I have in this unit square parameter space points that I'm allowed to be at and points that I'm not allowed to be at. And now my question to you is how does this parameter space tell me if the Frechet distance is at most epsilon or not? Think about it. Okay, I've moved to a new spot. Hopefully you've used this time to answer my question. We begin at the start of each line segment, so certainly the point zero, zero needs to be in the free space, needs to be allowed. Otherwise, the man and the dog can't even start and we've lost immediately. Similarly, the point one, one must be in the free space. And now the observation is both the man and the dog, so both on the x-axis and the y-axis, we need to walk continuously, monotonically non-decreasing, from zero to one. So what we're looking for is a path that goes somehow from the bottom left corner to the top right corner. First of all, within this unit square, the free space is convex. 
and you can think about this. So what does it mean? I have one point in the free space, I have another point in the free space, and then I have this linear interpolation between these two points in parameter space. Both of these two points are free. What happens if I move between them? I linearly interpolate the point on the one line segment. I linearly interpolate the point on the other line segment. What happens to the distance? And here you can observe that the maximum over this interpolation must occur at one of the endpoints. So if I have two points in parameter space, any linear combination of them has at most the same distance. So the free space itself is convex, and this is very useful for us, because then if we know that one point is free and another point is free, then I can just go there. Let's look at a single cell of parameter space for a line segment versus a line segment. And let's make it even simpler, let's just look at the edge. So we have a single point versus a line segment. So what is the distance between these two points? This is just the Euclidean distance where one point is static and the other linearly interpolates. So this is just a normal function from the interval 0 to 1 to a real number. And in terms of free space, the thing that's actually interesting about this is when is this less than epsilon and when is this more than epsilon? Because this distance function is clearly a parabola and in fact a non-negative parabola because these are distances and then the area where this is less than a certain epsilon must be just an interval or empty. For boundaries of the cell, I can calculate the intersection of this distance function with epsilon. And in the interval 0 to 1, there could be 0, 1, or 2 of these intersections. So on each of these boundaries, I have 0, 1, or 2 interesting points where it changes, and otherwise it's just the same. So now, finally, let's talk about polylines. There are two of them on the left, and on the right we see the parameter space, where now the cells aren't square. I've scaled them to correspond to the length of the corresponding line segment. So if you look at this cell over here, for example, then on the one axis, it corresponds to this red line segment. On the other axis, it corresponds to this blue line segment. And anywhere in this cell is just points on these two line segments. And in this way, the entire parameter space is just these pairs of points on these two polylines. Now, let's play around with this. Let's pick some values of epsilon and see what this does to the free space diagram. So if I pick a fairly small epsilon, then what we can see, we have to start in the bottom left corner. And then for a while, this works out. We are in free space, indicated in white, and these points can stay together. But we cannot make it past this point. At some point, either the red point has to go away or the blue point has to go away. And so these two polylines have Fréchet distance larger than this epsilon indicated by the red circle because I cannot get all the way to the end. There are these two other holes, let's say, in the free space diagram. In the middle, I can get the two points to be close to each other again. But I cannot get there. If I have to start with both of them in the origin, they have to go far away from each other before they can get this close again. And part of the problem there is this corner over here, the blue polyline goes away. So let's make epsilon large enough so that that works. And now we see a bunch of things happened in parameter space. So now epsilon is large enough to make blue go to this corner and then come around and then it's pretty easy, they can go together again for a bit, and now red makes this loop and needs to go away again, and now I am stuck. I cannot get to the top right corner. And the problem seems to be that blue went far ahead, so we went too high up in the parameter space. So maybe we can do this differently and instead go together for a while, go through this tiny gap in parameter space, and now I'm going to stay low which means that the blue point isn't going to progress very far. And then I do the entire loop with the red polyline. And now it can go there. But now I still have a problem. I still can't get to the end. And I mean, in parameter space, I can clearly see that the white area is not connected. So I'm not going to get to the top right corner, but I'm trying to get an intuition for what this means for the two polylines. 
I have to find a path from the bottom left corner to the top right corner, going in both directions monotonically and continuously. And it's just not connected yet, so epsilon needs to be larger still. And for example, this part is going to be important. Let's keep increasing epsilon and keep increasing epsilon until we get the connection. Oh, there it is. So now this is a way to do the Fourier distance with this leash. So first they go up, then they stay together a bit, and now I have to be careful that blue doesn't walk too far along, because then I'm stuck. So I was here, now I stay low, make red do the loop like I wanted to do before, and then now they can very carefully walk these two parallel lines, and now we're good again and we can get to the end. So for this value of epsilon indicated by the green circle, we can see in the free space diagram that this is a yes instance. There is a monotone path in both directions that gets me from the bottom left corner to the top right corner. And this is a little bit tricky because this can get super tiny thin. So this epsilon, if I could use my mouse a little bit more precisely, I could go precisely through here. There's also this free space down here at the bottom, but that really doesn't mean anything for our Fourier distance because this is not connected to anything that matters. But this is a point where I can get close on both of these polylines, but it just doesn't go anywhere. So now, using this concept of parameter space and free space, I think we understand the Fourier distance a lot better. But still, this parameter space is a continuous thing. So how do we actually calculate whether this path exists or not? Gut, das war's jetzt eigentlich. Ich hoffe, dass es interessant war. Und hier kommt jetzt noch das bisschen Mathe, das ich vorher übersprungen habe. Now here is the definition of the Fourier distance. We start with this distance function d, which is the Euclidean distance as usual. And then we throw in a point from the one polyline and one from the other, but re-parameterized by these functions alpha and beta. These will decide how the man and the dog walk along the polyline. Let's arbitrarily say that the argument to alpha and beta goes from 0 to 1, so like from the start to 100% progress. And we take the maximum over that. How long does the leash need to get if we progress among the polylines like this? We said the man and the dog could walk however they pleased and we wanted to take the best version of that. So finally we take the minimum over these functions alpha and beta. It might seem a little bit weird to minimize over functions, but mathematically there's nothing wrong with that. We just need to be a little bit more specific about what kind of functions. So like I said, I picked both of them to be from the real interval 0 to 1 to the real interval 0 to m minus 1. So then it works out with these parameterized curves p1 and p2. But I need to insist on a couple of properties of these functions alpha and beta. Think about it for a second. Mathematical functions can be really funky and do really weird things. So what do we want to restrict ourselves to so that this definition does what we want? Walking along the polyline and not going back. Well, let's start with a basic one first. We want alpha zero to equal beta zero to equal zero, because we should start at the beginning of each polyline. Similarly, alpha one and beta one should be m minus one, or m minus one and n minus one if my polylines have different length, because I need to get to the end of the polyline. What would happen if we forget about this condition and calculate this minimum without it? What would be the value of the Fourier distance? Well, I should find the point on P1 that is closest to some point on P2 and then just use alpha and beta to always give those two points. And then I'm really back at our very first definition of distance between polylines. I just look at what is the closest I can get on the one polyline to the other and the Euclidean distance between that is my answer. So in this example polyline, I just pick any one of these intersection points and then the distance is zero. So yeah, this first condition is necessary. What about not walking backwards? Well, we can just say that these functions need to be monotonically increasing. 
or to be slightly more specific, monotonically non-decreasing, because we do allow the value to stay the same. We do allow the man or the dog to stand still. And here's the last property that people tend to forget when I ask them in a live lecture, which is the function should be continuous. We don't allow any teleportation. And this is it. This is the definition of Frechet distance.